the regular meeting of the Faculty Senate will come to order. Um, today we have our colleagues from Potomac State College here with us, so we're not connected uh, to Potomac State, but we are connected to uh, WVU Tech, both in Montgomery and in Beckley. Um, so at WVU Tech in Montgomery, how many are present? Two senators are present at Tech. And uh, at Tech in Beckley, how many are present? Thank you. Uh, and we have a quorum. Uh, the minutes from the previous meeting have been distributed as an annex to your agenda. Are there any corrections to the minutes from the September meeting? Hearing none, uh, those minutes are approved as written. And next we have our report from Provost Joyce McConnell. Good afternoon, everyone. So when I sat down on my chair, I found this very beautiful bracelet. If it happens to belong to anyone, who, it's yours. Great. Oh, I'm so glad I found who it belonged to. I, th I thought I was going to be tempted by theft, and I had to get it off my hands as quickly as possible so that I could keep my integrity. Um, so um, it's wonderful to be here and wonderful to be here after the uh, President's State of the University Address. I know often that people are hesitant to ask questions in a really large crowd. Um, so I would first like to start, before I even make any of my remarks, to volunteer to take any additional questions that people might have that they would feel more comfortable uh, posing in this setting than in the larger setting. Great, okay, doesn't seem to be any, but maybe they'll come to mind. Uh, Oh, I got one, great. Hi, uh, just a clarification question, please. So we hear that 13 or 14% of the university's budget is state funds. Does that include promised scholarship allocations through that system? No. Okay, that's, that was the clarification, thanks. Yeah, no, it does not. And that's a complicating factor. About how much would you estimate that contributes overall? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can find out sure, for you. Thanks. Want to shoot me an email and remind me, and I can let you know and let everyone else know the next time. Um, and that is a very good point, but I do, I do think that um, in terms of thinking about the budget relatively for what the last 15 years we've had that. So when you think about the real cut, it still remains a significant cut. And and it's difficult. The the uh, promise and scholarship I think is just so incredibly important to our West Virginians, um, but it's a smaller and smaller percentage every year of what the actual expenses are, which makes it harder for our students. Um, so, but I'm, I'm glad you asked. Thank you. I had a question. Where? Oh, there you are. Hi, Virginia. <laughs> uh, hi. I, uh, Virginia Clay's College of Business and Economics. I just wanted to have um, a, a vision of where we're going to be in 10 years. What will the university look like? Where are we aiming for? Not five years out, but 10 or, 10 mm -hmm. or 15 years, the real long haul. And that, that was really what I'd like to hear about. Yeah, I think that's a, a great, great question. Um, let me start by saying that one of the things that we know about education now as compared to in the let's say 50s, 60s, and 70s, is that it's not static. Um, higher education is very dynamic now and changing very, very fast all the time. So one of the big changes, I think, will be um, a, a change about how we handle that rapid transition all the time. Um, we've, we've had the luxury um, over many, many years to um, do something, do it pretty slowly and deliberately, let it play out, re-examine it, assess, and usually in somewhere between five and ten year cycles. And everything I, I read and study right now is saying that we're really going through 18 month cycles of change. And so the, the ways in which um, the systems that we've used um, for making ourselves great I don't think those systems are necessarily going to be responsive enough to make us adaptive enough. 
So that's the first thing I would say about 10 years out, um, that we're, we're going to be moving much more rapidly um, and, um, and in, in the face of a lot of disruption. Um, and so part of what I think has been very important in my, my thinking about that, and I know in terms of Gordon as well, and he said this in his State of the University speech, we need to take control of our destiny. Otherwise, we're going to be buffeted around by all this change. We're going to end up in a disadvantage, in a disadvantageous position. And so when I think about where will we be in 10 years, first of all, I think we'll be very different. I think that we will have adapted to change um, in a very rapid nature. I think that we will see um, within that context a lot more multidisciplinarity, but I think we will also see things shut down much more quickly, right? Now we think once something is established, it's sustained forever. I think 10 years from now, we'll probably be in the rhythm of starting things, reassessing, and saying it didn't work, right? Which, you know, I, and I'm not saying these are all the pluses, <laughs> but they are the reality. I think we're going to have to really, what we do now and what we do necessarily during times of prosperity is in order to change something, we just keep adding. You know, we add new programs, we add new faculty, but we never take anything away or we never reallocate. And we just are not going to be able to do that in the next decade. So I think, I think you're going to see a lot of multidisciplinarity. I think that's going to impact um, more than it has in the past how we evaluate faculty. Um, I think that, uh, that we are going to integrate the teaching professors much more than we have up to now. We've been moving in that direction, but I think that that will be something that we'll definitely see in 10 years. I do think that there is a very high regard at this university, both by Gordon and me, um, for tenure. So I don't think you're, you're not hearing from us some of what you hear from other states about doing away with tenure. Um, I think tenure has served a very important purpose um, and continues to serve that purpose. The one thought that I have had, um, which I've talked to other members of the faculty about, so I'll just say it more publicly, and this is, this is just purely my imagination, but when tenure was invented, um, people didn't live as long as we do. Um, it's just true. And so when tenure was for life, it was for a much shorter period of time. And that allowed the kind of um, rotation of more senior people out and more junior people in and kept the, had the potential to keep universities very fresh, right? Fresh new ideas, fresh new PhDs, et cetera. So one thing I've thought about is what if tenure was 35 years after you got, it lasted 35 years, and then you could be renewed every year after that if you were, you know, if your, your college needed you, you were performing well, you still had a research agenda, et cetera. Um, now, that's, I don't want anyone to misconstrue that as the end of tenure. What I'm saying is that that's, if where you have pressure all around the country saying, well, our problem is the tenure system. I don't think our problem is the tenure system. I think that the tenure system has allowed us to have free speech on campus, um, which I think is extraordinarily important to us and nationally. Um, that's a little digression from where you, we will be in 10 years. I do think one of the things that the president talked about is the importance of enrollment. I think that as our, um, uh, as the percentage of state appropriation continues to decline, which I think it will, in our state and throughout the country, I don't, we're not alone. Um, we're gonna have more and more attention paid to enrollment. And I think that means looking at new programs that will attract students who otherwise wouldn't have been attracted. What we've done in the past is we said we were going to go grow enrollment, but usually what we're doing is stealing it from another college. Um, now we really have to think hard about what is it that we can do here that's going to attract a greater number of students. Um, 
And, and there may be some resistance to that because people get within their discipline and they want to hold on to something and they don't necessarily want to see it teased out in multidisciplinary ways for a new program. Um, so the, I think those are some of our challenges, but I think that that's what you'll see much more in 10 years. What, what would be really wonderful is if we could write the um, recipe for transitioning a large public flagship land grant research one university. If 10 years from now people said WVU really tackled this, they worked really hard at it, and look where they are now. And, and I think in order to do that, we have to be open, both our hearts and our minds, to um, the kind of transition um, that we're going to be working through. Does that help see in 10 years? Um, I did have one more addition to that was where do you see online in that mix as we grow? Yeah, I, um, think, I think online is really important um, to where we go and we have a new dean of um, our extended um, and online learning, um, Keith Bailey, and he is um, going to be working with each of the colleges to talk about what kinds of programs they see from the college that would really be something that could translate to online well and draw in additional enrollment. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about, um, and I'm sure Sue Day Perutz, who's our former dean um, sitting here, um, who is now the associate provost for undergraduate education, for those of you who don't know Sue, um, is that with community colleges, students are there for two years. And the idea behind a community college is to get them into the workforce fast, right? These may be students who have no other source of income. So they're going to stay close to home, they're going to live at home, they're going to do two years, and they're going to get out in the workforce. But that doesn't necessarily mean they want to end their academic career. If we could think about the needs of those people for um, continuing their education onto a BA, that is a wonderful opportunity for um, online enrollment for us and for education for them. Um, because what happens is a lot of um, community college students end up that that two years is all they can do and that's the end. And I think we could do an incredible service, particularly within the boundaries of the state, if we could begin to think about what those programs could be. Because what we know about education, right, is you can do two years and it can help you get a job and that's great. But the two years more that gets you the bachelor's degree opens the world, right? And what we're, what we're doing with people getting the two years de degrees is we're limiting them. And I don't think, I think we can play a role in, in helping them move on. Also, I mean, you know there's also all kinds of specialty programs, right? Graduate level programs, et cetera. But, but I'd like to see us drive down online learning to, to really give the gift of higher education to a lot of people who otherwise couldn't afford it. Other questions? Okay, great. Do you want to hear anything more from me, or is my time up? Oh, you don't care? Okay. <laughs> she doesn't care. <laughs> um, one of the things that you heard in the State of the University Address is the incredible caliber of our students. And um, one of the things we've also seen through the Aspire office and then its engagement with our faculty is the kind of guidance all of you are giving to our students is getting better and better. Um, so the students are better, the guidance is better, the caliber of advising is better. Um, Sude Prutz really has worked on advising along with Joe Seaman, the Dean of Completion. Um, and uh, that you, you may, this may not be on your radar screen, so I'm gonna explain this to you because Sue did a phenomenal thing this summer. We took all of the academic portions out of student life that had just kind of rested there for a long time, but hadn't engaged with the academic side um, very well. And we moved all of those into undergraduate education. And what that did was allow this synergy 
between all the things that were going on in student life with all the things we were trying to do on the academic side, particularly for our undergraduates. Um, a really concrete example is before Sue um, started to move things, we knew that there were 38 different tutoring programs. Um, on campus, and we also knew that we were not getting the results from those 38. And so we brought those all together, tutors are being trained, they're being coordinated, our students are getting a much higher caliber of support now. So those are the kinds of consolidations we've been doing and really trying to uh, target. Um, but Sue did all of uh, moved accessibility services so that it's tied more closely with academics now, which will be an incredible help for our faculty, but m even more significantly for our students who need our support. Um, so accessibility services, um, tutoring, career services, what else did you move? Upward Bound, Trio, and that's it, okay. And then we moved um, the Center for um, Service and Learning into Student Life because students were doing that more volunteer than they were doing it for credit. Sue did all of that in about 60 days. And that's warp speed. So Virginia, that's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about moving quickly to respond to, to disruption. So that was, we decided it. I told Sue we decided it, and then she did it, and that's how fast. Same thing with global. We took, for those of you who don't know, we took pieces of global, and we pulled them all together and put them under the Vice President for Global Affairs, um, and we did that in less than 60 days as well. Um, so we, we really saw some places where we could be much more efficient, deliver better services, and we did it as fast as, uh, as Gordon likes to say, warp speed. Um, but those are really good points of success, I think, for what we did. But the reason I'm telling you about that is as the Aspire office is in the Honors College but serves all undergraduate and graduate students. The Aspire office has been helping more and more of our students get those 30 national awards, um, so continuing to get those Goldwaters, those Borens. Um, we have a finalist for Rhodes again. We're, we're really uh, working hard, and Catherine Al Al Aselstad, who, Alistad, who is in history, works with our Rhodes Scholars and has been working very hard to try to get us one. Um, all of you will have received a culture survey and you'll say, oh my God, not another culture survey. This one is actually um, coming out from a firm um, at, that we hired. People said, why did we use the firm? It was cheaper to use the firm than to go in-house, so it was a budget-saving matter, but we think this firm has the expertise that we need. But unlike other surveys, this one went to all faculty and all staff, and what it's trying to do is get a sense of your perception your sense of culture. And so I encourage you all to fill it out if you haven't already. It's very important for us to get that data. Um, on, uh, on diversity, I think that this is really important. You saw the real uptick in um, applications from diversity candidates, and you saw a 27% uptake in the number who, that were admitted. Um, and that's really something very, very important. Now what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're recruiting them. So we admit them and then they actually choose us over another college. And that's something that we need to work on. The big 12 diversity officers were here two weeks ago. It's hard to remember. Um, but they were very, very impressed with what we're doing on campus. And um, I think that they felt very good about the approach that we were taking um, with our students and making sure that our students um, are engaged with us in dialogue. Um, and we really have been engaging with our students, talking to our students. You know that there's been some um, vigils that have been held. Those vigils have been excellent, um, respectful, wonderful places for people to, to share um, their sense of uh, anger and their sense of hurt but do it in a way um, 
where we can be proud of at the exercise of free speech. And that's something I think we should all be proud of here, um, that we've done that. Um, on that note, um, there is going to be a controversial speaker. Um, I have to remember the date here, November 2nd. His name is uh, Milo Yiannopoulos. He's um, a speaker that will come as part of the Breitbart um, tour uh, that's being done on campuses. Um, the, he is um, incredibly, um, I think the best thing to say is he is uh, anti-LGBTQ+, and um, he is going around to various um, colleges to talk about this. The, he was invited here by our Student Republican Caucus uh, organization, um, and obviously that's um, something that we respect, uh, respect their right to speech and to have an invited speaker that we may not agree with. Um, but we do know that other student groups, um, and Bob Bastris is sitting here, and I remember Bob said to me, the best antidote to um, to hate, to hate speech is um, more love speech, right? Um, and th that, that's exactly what the student groups are gonna do. They're organizing to, to engage in speech that is counter um, to the speaker. So uh, you'll, you'll be hearing about that from some of your students and probably reading more about it in the DA. Um, our Benedum Scholar Lectures kicked off, and their, uh, Dr. Jing Sen Wang um, spoke last week, and that was really wonderful. And Jonelle Strog is going to speak on October 17th, and Cheryl Ball on November 3rd. Um, I do want to remind you that the Honors Class College announced that they're accepting applications for their inaugural class of faculty fellows. It's an incredible, exci incredibly exciting opportunity to participate in honors, um, and it's uh, fully supported by my office. It, faculty members will be able to engage with some of our brightest, uh, most able students, and you can design your dream class um, for your dream students. So it's very, very exciting times in the Honors College with 900 students this year, which is pretty incredible, 18% of the entering class. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is I've been teaching freshman seminar. Um, it has been fabulous because we completely redid freshman seminar as part of our Project 168. And um, I have some favorite students, and I'd love to tell you stories about them, but I'll sit down now. I'm sorry, are there any other questions? And any questions from tech? Okay, thank no you very much. No questions from Montgomery, thank you. All right. Uh, so the Office of the Registrar has been working with the Curriculum Committee and the Jeffco uh, to look at harmonization across campuses and how we can make sure that every campus knows when a course that affects them is going to be changed. Um, so for those of you that use Kim a lot um, relatively soon, we need to do some education to the people who are affected. Um, what will happen now is if you enter a course change or enter a new course that affects multiple campuses, the department chair from each campus will have to sign off on that before it gets to either the curriculum or the, the Jeff committee. Uh, so that's something to watch out for. That hasn't completely rolled out yet, uh, but it will be soon. Uh, October 19th is the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating. Uh, here on campus, there will be a couple of uh, events going on to raise awareness about contract cheating. Uh, the SGA is sponsoring some student-centered uh, programming on October 19th. Uh, the next day, uh, the Teaching and Learning Commons is hosting Think Twice Thursday, um, and it will review uh, the university's newly revised academic dishonesty policy. And I believe this is an encore of uh, Go First Friday uh, from, uh, from about a month ago, and that was a, a really nice presentation. Um, this upcoming spring, the libraries uh, will be launching a new uh, student-centered plagiarism avoidance tutorial. Uh, that will be free to all students and faculty, so look out for that next, next spring as well. 
Does anybody have any questions for me? Okay, up next we have uh, the curriculum committee report and I recognize Karen Haynes to give that report. Karen, <clears throat> Karen Haynes, Communication Sciences and Disorders. Um, in your, um, on your agenda, you will see that we have for your approval the new courses report, and that is Annex 1. Okay. Are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 1? Okay. All those in favor of approving Annex 1, please say aye. Any opposed say no. All right, Tech in Montgomery, how do you vote? Two ayes. Tech in, tech in Beckley, how do you vote? All right, the ayes have it. Annex 1 is approved. Next, we have for your approval the course changes report, and that is Annex 2. Uh, are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 2? All those in favor of approving Annex 2, please say aye. Any opposed, no. Tech in Montgomery, how do you vote? Montgomery votes two ayes. Tech in Beckley, how do you vote? Beckley votes one aye. All right, Annex 2 is approved. Next, we have for your approval the capstone course report, Annex 3. Are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 3? All those in favor of approving Annex 3, please say aye. Any opposed, no. Tech in Montgomery, how do you vote? Tech in Montgomery votes two aye. Tech in Beckley, how do you vote? All right, Annex 3 is approved. Next, we have for your approval a new AOE area of emphasis in environmental assessment and reclamation. Okay. Is there any objection or point of discussion for this area of emphasis? All those in favor of approving the area of emphasis in environmental assessment and reclamation, please say aye. <coughs> any opposed, no. Tech in Montgomery, how do you vote? Tech in Montgomery votes two aye. Tech in Beckley, how do you vote? All right, the new area of emphasis is approved. And lastly, for your information, we have the alterations report, and that's Annex 4. Okay. Are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex 4? Hearing none, Annex 4 is filed. Next, we have Lisa DeBartolomeo for the Jeffco report. So we have Annex 5, which is Jeff Af Action's new gen ed courses, six new courses approved for general education foundations. Are there any objections or points of discussion for Annex 5? All those in favor of approving Annex 5, please say aye. Any opposed, no. Tech in Montgomery, how do you vote? Tech in Montgomery votes two aye. Tech in Beckley, how do you vote? Aye. Annex five is approved. And for Annex six, I would like to take a moment to remind everyone that this annex is providing Jeff transition. So. If you would like to transition your general education course or someone in your unit would like to transfer their course from one Jeff area to another, all you have to do is basically apply and you present your justification why the course should be in a new area as opposed to the area where we put you. If you recall a few years ago when Nigel and I were doing this, we were in contact with all the chairs and all the unit heads and got the sign off on where to put all of the classes. But we're open to changes, so if you're not pleased with where your course is right now and you present uh, rationale, then we're happy to change them for you. So if anyone in your department is asking about that, I would encourage you to take this back to your constituents and let them know that there's room to move. 
Uh, are there any questions or points of discussion for Annex 6? Hearing none, Annex 6 is filed. Uh, next, we have the Board of Governors report from Stan Hallman. Um, we have not had a meeting since the last report, so I'll make everybody happy and say I have nothing to report. Um, the next meeting will be the first week in November. Okay, thank you. All right, I, we have one item of new business that I'm aware of, and I would like for CB to come up and give us an update on um, who he needs for the PNT University review panel. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Lena. Um, we have, I can report that we have seven volunteers for the faculty advisory panel. That would be the equivalent of the university level PNT committee. What I'm concerned about is the mix that we have. Uh, of course, we always try to get one person from a regional campus, and we have that. We have six other individuals who have volunteered three of them from the Health Sciences Center, two of whom are tenured, and one of them is a TAP. We have three individuals from the general university, two TAPs and one CAP. Now you can tell that we have a very limited number of tenure or tenure track faculty, and before we actually lock the committee in, I'd like to have some more volunteers in that general, well, from, hopefully the general university, people who are tenured uh, before we establish what the final mix will be. Uh, we don't yet know completely how many uh, cases will have to be considered, but we know that uh, it looks like in health sciences there will be more than last year, and last year there were 40. And uh, there were 80 in the general university. We're already at 60 and we've still got five units to report. So I'd like to have additional volunteers before we actually lock in the, the nature of the, uh, the, the committee or the panel, whichever term you would like to choose. You do not have to reveal yourself to me personally right now. You can send me an email, that would be fine, and then we'll compile our list and make some assignments uh, subsequent to that. So that's it, thank you. Is there any other new business? All right. Hearing none, can I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Meeting adjourned.